at the southern edge of Death Valley, within the scorching foothills of the Mojave Desert, there's a desolate chunk of rocky, sandy, silty terrain full of thick cactus and giant boulders. To the untrained eye, it's an uninhabited wasteland. This lonely stretch of barren dirt runs 100 miles from the California border into the heart of Nevada, Sin City, Las Vegas. It contains some of the most unforgiving wilderness on the planet and is home to one of the most legendary races in history. In 1968, the Las Vegas Mint Hotel held the first ever Mint 400 Rally, I can't believe this place. which sparked the birth of modern desert endurance racing in the United States. And for over a half century, a special breed of American racer has tried to tame these brutal badlands year after year. For 2019, the owners of the Mint 400, the Martelli brothers, have orchestrated the triumphant return of motorcycles to the famed race for the first time in 43 years. 160 bike teams have shown up to compete, and they are joined by 400 of the most badass four-wheel desert race teams in the sport. 549 desert warriors total, representing 12 countries and 33 states who will all compete for two days on the most destructive and challenging race course in North America for a chance to have their names etched into automotive racing history. This is the BF Goodrich Tires Mint 400, powered by Monster Energy, right now on ABC's World of X Games. It's three days before the 51st annual Mint 400, and over 100 of the top unlimited, class one, and unlimited spec trucks have gathered for the seventh annual Method Race Wheels time trials. Unlimited trucks are the top unrestricted fire-breathing dragons of the sport. They boast 850 to 1,000 horsepower motors and are hand-built from the ground up on a custom chassis with precision fabricated steel tube roll cages. They sit on 39 to 42 inch tires and have anywhere from 24 to 36 inches of suspension travel with a top speed of 140 plus miles per hour. The vast majority are built on a rear straight axle two wheel drive system with A arms up front that allow them to absorb impacts that would destroy the average truck instantly. However, there have been recent advancements in four-wheel drive systems, and there are several of those trucks here today. For the past 10 years, every single overall winner has qualified in the top 10 positions. Uh, last year, uh, we were out here at Apex for the Mint, and I got the overall in my Class 1500 car. Um, this year, I'm with Concrete Motorsports in the number 70 trick truck, so been watching my video from uh, last year and we're going to go out there and try to lay down another top spot and be the first one off on uh, race day. Qualifying is always important for any race, especially the Mint 400. Um, this race is it, typically it's pretty fast at the beginning and very, very rough at the end. So you want to get a good starting position. You don't have to deal with too much traffic. But we've got more rain than we've typically we get annually. We've already had more rain here in the Las Vegas area and I know out there in Gene and Prim. It'll affect the course uh, somewhat. Most likely the ground will be more hard packed. I think uh, once we go around the track a couple times, start going to get rutted up, get gnarly square edge stuff. You know, I think it's going to be very, very rough at the end. The unlimited trucks and class one cars lined up and one by one, they began to rip down the treacherous Method Race Wheels qualifying course. Harden, Bowers and Terzo were the first to take on the five mile contest. All three put the pedal down right off the start line. But it was U Theory Racing's Anthony Terzo in the number 55 truck who was noticeably faster than the others. Terzo's family has a long lineage in the sport. His dad was a SCORE checkpoint volunteer in his teenage years. Their success with their premium supplement company U Theory inspired Anthony and his brother Jeff to move up the ranks to the top tier unlimited class. 
Anthony finished qualifying in four minutes and 26 seconds, setting a blistering pace for the rest of the field. Minutes later, Jason Strachan from Heber City, Utah took his turn. He mashed it a little bit too hard on the back straight through and hit the massive step up with too much speed, sending his truck into a front flip. But Jason never took his foot off the gas. He landed on all four wheels and managed to finish his run. Fifth off the line was 64-year-old Sam Barry in his single-seat Jimco Class 1 car. Sam has been racing for several decades and has won many of the biggest races, including the Mint 400 in 2015. He looked smooth and poised through the rough terrain. He put down a four minute, 42 second run for the day. It was a good run for class one, but minutes later, Justin Davis out of Chino Hills, California, shaved a full 12 seconds off Sam's time, moving into first in class thus far. The number 123 Levi's Unlimited truck, driven by Ryan Arciero, came screaming through next. The Arciero and Herbst families are both multi-generational, multi-class, championship-winning families. Ryan was showing his decades of experience and pushed his truck right up to the absolute edge. He ripped through the finish gate with a time of 4 minutes 24 seconds, setting the fastest time of the day thus far. Minutes later, the number 70 Concrete Motorsports truck came exploding down the qualifying course. Driver Harley Lettner was the fastest man on this very track last year and took home the Mint 400 Class 1 Championship before being recruited to his new team by owner Kevin Thompson. With several big wins under their belt already, the Concrete Motorsports team were considered by many to be the dark horse coming into the Mint this year, and for good reason. Lettner chopped seven seconds off the fastest time of the day thus far and put his team out front with a time of four minutes, 17 seconds. But it was short-lived. Las Vegas native and two-time Mint 400 champion Bryce Menzies came thundering by in his brand new Huseman Brothers four-wheel drive Red Bull Unlimited truck at breakneck speed. Bryce made quick work of the five-mile course, seeming to skip right over some of the biggest ruts and g outs He knew that pushing hard now would help him battle for the win on Sunday. Bryce blasted through the finish gate with an unbelievable time of four minutes, nine seconds. He had just raised the bar incredibly high for the rest of the field. Up next, it was 20-year-old Cole Potts out of Scottsdale, Arizona. Cole ran the first half of the course clean, but got into trouble on the back straightaway jump when his truck preloaded at a slight angle. He flew upside down through the air and catapulted down the track in a hail of dirt and broken truck parts. Luckily, neither he nor his co-driver were injured, a testament to the quality of their Geyser Brothers built unlimited truck. Off-road racing has been described as driving on the edge of disaster. To win a race like the Mint, you have to push yourself far outside your comfort zone. It's the unpredictable nature of racing on the dirt that makes it so thrilling. And the current field of racers were pulling no punches as they each took their turn ripping down the challenging time trials course. Meanwhile, in Class 1, 2016 Mint 400 champion Cody Parkhouse was up and flying down the course. He was trying to beat the 17 other Class 1 cars for the best starting spot in class, and he did just that. He put down a time of 4 minutes 21 seconds, beating out some of the unlimited trucks, and he moved into first in Class 1. Number 37, Jeff Terzo, had a clean and fast run until he hit the step-up jump with too much speed as well. Terzo launched nearly 20 feet in the air before landing on his front bumper and saving the truck by driving out of it. Remarkably, he would finish in the top 40 of the day. 2018 Mint 400 champion Rob McCachran came through next. Rob drove his Geyser Brothers Rockstar Energy Unlimited truck like a bat out of hell and made it look way too easy. When the dust settled, he moved into fourth for the day with a time of four minutes, 18 seconds. 
However, the young buck Brett Serapis out of Rancho Santa Fe, California came blazing through in his number 88 Coors Light truck and bested McCachron by a mere tenth of a second. Brett was coming off a win at the Parker 425 and you could see the confidence in his driving. Here's a look at the unlimited and class one results from the Method Race Wheels time trials. In the unlimited spec class, also known as 6100, there were over 50 racers, some with decades of experience under their belts. Others who were literally showing up this year for their first qualifying race ever. Matt Laughlin led the hungry pack off the start line in his Chevy powered Geyser Brothers truck. Matt is the grandson of the late Don Laughlin and the chief operating officer of the Riverside Resort. Behind him, another casino luminary, Bill McBeth, CEO of the Cosmopolitan in Las Vegas, came ripping through. Bill has been a great supporter of the sport and the Mint 400 race for over a decade. He was on fire today and finished with a time of 4 minutes 54 seconds, just missing a top 10 finish by less than a second. Minutes later, it was 31-year-old Troy Messer out of Kingman, Arizona, driving his Restoration 1 truck powered by Armada engines. Troy looked fast, real fast. He threw down a time of 4 minutes 33 seconds and moved into first overall. Adam Ray Lund, another Armada engine racer from Argyle, Texas, took his turn a few minutes later. He pushed it just hard enough to earn the second fastest qualifying time of the day so far. A few minutes later though, Brock Hedger in the 6183 Tisco truck shook the scoreboard up. Brock ripped through the course with laser focus and put down a time of four minutes, 29 seconds, moving into first place, a full four seconds faster than the next truck. Honorable mentions go to Las Vegas Sheriff Joe Lombardo and Jensen Button. Lombardo took time off from his duties as Sheriff of Las Vegas to come race and finished a very respectable 28th on the day. Former Formula One racer Jensen Button also finished well, considering how little seat time he had prior to the Mint this year. Here's a look at the results from the unlimited spec class for the seventh annual Method Race Wheels Time Trials. In 1967, a group of off-road pioneers led by Leroy Wickham set out on a long-distance voyage in two hand-built VW buggies. Wickham wanted to prove his cars were robust enough, so he and some friends drove from Fremont Street in Las Vegas to the Sahara Hotel in Lake Tahoe on dirt roads, hoping to set a world record for the longest off-road journey in history. When news coverage from around the world began to surface, it caught the attention of Mint 400 Hotel Executive Bill Bennett. One year later, Wickham was laying out the course for the first ever Dell Webb Mint 400 Desert Rally. Mel Larson and Parnelli Jones helped promote and compete in the first event, and motorcycle racer J.N. Roberts won the first race overall, which ran from Las Vegas out to Beatty and back. By 1971, the Mint had captured the imagination of the entire U.S. racing community, and icons Mickey Thompson, Bob and Al Unser, and actors Steve McQueen and Lee Majors had joined the growing list of professional and celebrity racers. The star-studded competition had grown to well over 350 entries, and the purse had swelled to over $100,000. That year, Gonzo author Hunter S. Thompson wrote his famous Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas article. In it, he said, they were spread out all over the course. It was no longer a race. Now it was an endurance contest. The only visible action was at the start finish line, where every few minutes some geek would come speeding out of the dust cloud and stagger off his bike while his pit crew would gas it up and then launch it back onto the track with a fresh driver for another 50-mile lap. Another brutal hour of kidney-killing madness out there in that terrible dust-line limbo. 
Hunter's article was adapted into a best-selling novel and later made into a film starring Johnny Depp and Benicio Del Toro, which became a cult classic and played tribute to The Mint's importance in American pop culture. For the next 20 years, The Mint continued to grow in popularity and spectacle, at one time topping 400 entries in 1979 and allowing both a full-size RV and a tank to compete in the famed contest. A key figure in the event's ongoing success was the marketing guru K.J. Howe. Howe joined the Mint Hotel publicity staff in the early 70s and developed the Girls of the Mint 400, an off-road beauty contest that catapulted the careers of countless models, including Linda Carter and Vanna White, and added both class and sophistication to the event. The Mint continued to host the top off-road champions from around the planet, including Walker Evans, Fritz Kroyer, Ivan Stewart, Rod Hall, Larry Ragland, and Larry Rossler, as well as Indy 500 legends Rick Mears and Roger Ward. In 1988, the Mint Hotel was sold and became part of Binion's Gambling Hall, and the original race organizers disbanded. It ran one last time as the Binion's Nissan Mint 400, but then slipped into relative obscurity and was forgotten for nearly 20 years. In 2008, the Mint came screaming back to life. And since then, a virtual who's who of off-road racing's top drivers have taken home the overall win. Chuck Hovey and Brian Collins, Scott and Andy McMillan, Larry Rossler and Roger Norman, B.J. Baldwin and Robbie Gordon have each had their moment on the podium. Andy McMillan won the race a second time in his career in 2014, and Justin Lofton shocked the world by winning back-to-back -back victories in 2015 and 2016. Living off-road legend Rob McCachran took his place in the record books in 2017. And last year, it was Las Vegas native and 2013 champion Bryce Menzies who took home the gold for a second time. The Mint 400 was acquired by the Martelli brothers in 2011, and for the past eight years has been part of the Best in the Desert series. The Mint has once again become a worldwide spectacle that attracts both the best off-road racing talent and celebrities from around the world. It has become the most visible event in the sport, earning its distinction as the Great American Off-Road Race. The Mint 400 four-wheel race course has held the reputation as one of the most destructive and bone-jarring in all of North America for over half a century. And even though it's changed in its format and layout 10 times in 51 years, it remains one of the most challenging in the sport. Las Vegas is surrounded on all sides by beautiful but treacherous desert landscape. Death Valley, Red Rock Canyon, and the Mojave all converge in the Las Vegas Valley. And it's in these hills that the Mint has gained worldwide fame for its destructive nature. Typically less than half of the field that start the race ever finish. The 2019 race course spanned 120 miles, stretched from the Prim Valley Resort out deep into the McCullough Mountains and around to the city of Jean near Terrible's Hotel and Casino. It featured a side-by-side -side start that led immediately into a tough infield section held in front of tens of thousands of off-road race fans. This year, the course ran clockwise, so the competitors left Prim and raced due north across the Roach Dry Lake bed and through a sandy, whooped-out section known as Chokers. The racers then blasted around the mountain and through Thumpers at race mile 20. Thumpers is one of the few areas on the course where it's possible to pass, but it's risky. The three-foot ruts offer no quarter if you hit them at the wrong speed. After a quick stop in pit A, the teams pass through one of the most challenging parts of the race, the Fox Proving Grounds. This section is full of massive holes and boulders that put the driver's suspensions to the ultimate test. After several miles of fast single track, the racers reached the quarry, which is a hyper-technical spectator area with a lot of elevation changes and gotchas. It's not uncommon to see a rollover here, 
At race mile 45, it was the shooting range, a long, nasty section of squared off bumps and gullies that led into yet another desolate valley. The teams wound their way through the canyon at race mile 55. After racing due south for several more miles, they passed through Pit B, their last chance to grab fuel and tires if needed before the sprint to the main pit and finish line. Most of the top teams never stop at either of the remote pits unless it's absolutely necessary. This race is won or lost by a matter of seconds. The next 15 miles were mostly flat and fast gravel roads that let the drivers stretch their legs a bit and avoid each other's dust. But by race mile 92, they were forced to slow down and navigate the twisting and churning Joshua Tree Highway as they came back down and through the McCullough Mountain Pass. Once through, it was a sprint back to the prim finish line through the main pit and back out onto the course for more. There were over 20 classes of vehicles this year, and each would compete for one, two, or three laps, depending on their size and speed. For safety, the race was broken up into three groups. The limited race on Saturday afternoon, which featured Jeep Speed, Vintage, Sportsman UTVs, and more. A Sunday morning race that showcased the faster Class 10 cars, Pro UTVs, Sportsman, and several of the larger and faster limited classes and the unlimited race, which started at noon on Sunday and included the unlimited spec trucks, class one cars, and massive unlimited trucks. No two laps at the Mint 400 are the same. The course is constantly changing and becoming more degraded and challenging. Lap traffic and slower racers become a factor almost immediately, as passing is only possible on about 30% of the course. This format and race course have become the most challenging in the sport, making just finishing the Mint a cause for celebration. Saturday, March 9th, 7 a.m. As the pack of 160 desert motorcycle racers spanning 20 different classes began to line up at the official Mint 400 Prim Valley start-finish line, the crowd of race fans looked on anxiously. The 2019 Mint 400 bike race was 43 years in the making and was about to get underway. The start format was a mass by class, dead engine, land rush start. J.N. Roberts held up the 30-second start car and all of the riders took their positions. The start banner dropped and the first pack took off. Number 15, Ricky Brabeck tore off the start line and shot all the way across the pack for the whole shot coming into turn one. He was followed closely by Wyatt Brittner and another Honda bike rider, Danny Cooper, right behind him. A few minutes later, Cooper passed Brittner and moved into second, right behind Brayback as the pack began to spread out a bit. Row after row, the motorcycles blasted off the start line, over the first rollers, through the infield, and out into the open desert. Angie Wright got past Florian Schwartz early on, and Nick Robertson flew off the big jump as he looked to push out front and find clean air. Number W3 Kimberly Bussing and number F11 Jason St. John led their respective classes as they came screaming through the infield. And finally, the vintage pre-modern class left the start line. These street bike conversions were in for a long and bumpy ride. James Hill set out early on to prove there is, in fact, bumping to pass on bikes. He gave Barry Nobles a little love tap in the infield. Back up front, it was Danny Cooper in first now, mere feet ahead of Brayback, and number N12 Jacob Argebright from Lake Elsinore, California, who sat in third as the lead pack made their way out of the infield and into the open desert. The bike race was already turning into a blur of passing and lead changes. Argebright got past Brabeck and caught Danny Cooper minutes later. Brabeck caught back up to Cooper and passed him, and then minutes later got around Argebright for the lead, heading into chokers. Argebright looked solid and fast, coming through seconds later, followed by Danny Cooper, who was riding a Honda out of Heber City, Utah. Mark Samuels from Pioneer Town, California, wasn't far off in the mix either. He sat in fourth and was sweeping for the lead pack right at race mile 17. 
Within 20 minutes, Argebright had moved into the lead again as he and Brabeck passed race mile 30. Meanwhile, the vintage pre-modern classes were making their way to chokers. Mikey Hill was making it look a little too easy. Mark Atkins, aka Rusty Butcher, was on his tail though. The boys in vintage would only run two laps this year in order to give them a fighting chance to finish. Jason St. John from Logandale, Nevada came through in second place in the family team class. And Nick Robertson came flying through next, leading his class. Back up front, Argobright led the way through race mile 37, followed closely by Brayback. It was Mark Samuels in third, less than a minute behind the two leaders. Danny Cooper had fallen off the mark a bit. He was leading a chase pack with Talon Taylor and Brody Honea, both Nevada locals. A few minutes later, Brayback once again regained the lead and looked strong as he passed the midway point of lap one. He cruised through pit B and raced on towards the prim start-finish area. He reached the main pit and his team swapped a rear tire and changed drivers. 34-year-old Kendall Norman from El Cajon, California hopped on the JCR Honda and ripped out onto the course. Argebright had moved into first while the team was in the pit, but Kendall was catching up fast. He had fresh arms and a fresh rear tire and was chomping at the bit to get dirty. Though Argebright led through the infield section, Kendall caught the younger racer by race mile 15. Norman came ripping through chokers and looked poised and fast. 20 minutes later, the two came blasting through race mile 35, still first and second. Jacqueline Carrizosa, Ashley Ross, and Kimberly Bussing were all having a solid day. The women riders showed up in force this year, a welcome addition to the Mint 400's diverse talent pool. 15-year-old Brock Collins led a large pack of riders on his second lap. Up ahead, Norman was still out front for JCR Honda, but Jacob Argebright held his own on lap two. He didn't fall off the mark at all and stuck right on Norman's bumper the entire lap. The two came racing down beer bottle pass one after each other. Mark Samuels and Talon Taylor were still hanging tight in third and fourth, but if they didn't stay close, Kendall and Jacob were bound to check out. Sean Spencer was making his way through the canyon as well. The deep sand was murder on the arms. Angie Wright was behind Sean, climbing through the thick rock, holding her own. The boys on the vintage bikes weren't having much fun either. They were still on lap one, grinding it out with almost no suspension. For lap three, the JCR team swapped Norman for Brayback, who sat in first as he ripped through the infield. But Jacob Argebright, who was still in Iron Man mode, was right on his tail. Jacob was definitely out to prove he had the tenacity to finish the mint solo, but it was a long and treacherous race still. Brayback blasted out into the open desert on the third lap. He looked fresh and poised. Argebright remained close behind. 300A leader Jacob Endress passed through mile 37 on his second and final lap. Many of the bike classes were limited to two laps this year due to time constraints. Ricky Brabeck remained out front as he came whipping past race mile 60. Argebright was mere seconds off his bumper. And Mark Samuels was still in third place after moving ahead of David Cooper on lap one. Brabeck hit the canyon and was making it look all too easy. Nick Robertson was headed toward the finish of his second and final lap. Dual sport leader James Hill was still picking off racers on his final lap. And Jacob Endress led a big pack of bikes back into the infield on his way to the finish line. As the seconds ticked down, it was Ricky Brabeck with JCR Honda that came blazing through the checkered flag. He was followed closely by Jacob Argebright, who took second place overall and Mark Samuels, who finished a very respectable third. Ricky Brabeck and the JCR Honda team celebrated their overall and class victory for the first Mint 400 motorcycle race in 43 years. James Hill, meanwhile, took home the win in the dual sport class. And Nick Robertson celebrated his victory.
Jacob Argebright earned a coveted finisher's jersey for soloing the race. And Barry Nobles from Sun City, California took home the win in vintage pre-modern on his custom Harley Davidson after finishing two of the brutal Mint 400 motorcycle laps. Here's a look at all of the 2019 Mint 400 motorcycle class winners. Saturday, 12.30 p.m. The total entry count at the Mint this year surged to 549 racers, beating the previous record in 1977 by over 100. To accommodate the growth, the Martelli brothers expanded the racing from one to two days, and over 100 teams spread across 15 different classes began to line up for this year's limited race. The fastest machines were the Class 5000 buggies, built around four-cylinder engines with no forced induction. The Spec Class Trophy light trucks were right behind them. On the other end of the spectrum were the Class 11 racers, who were in near-stock vehicles, like their vintage racing brethren. There were also over 30 UTVs mixed in the bunch in three different classes, including the new Rally Class, which allowed for a stock UTV with a few minor modifications to be raced. This group represented both the old school throwback racer and the new guy, and all of them were ready to race. Donald Jackson brought the teams up to the starting grid, and as the lights turned green, they were off. Travis Chase and Taylor Atchison ripped off the start line first in Class 5000, and Travis got the jump on Taylor in his black and blue Chase Motorsports car. He boosted off the first jump and took the whole shot into turn one. Next up, it was Moser on the outside and Grabowski on the inside in his blue Subaru machine. Neil took the lead early and by turn two had pulled away from Moser. Chris Schweers and Christian Fessler were next and it was Schweers in his Jägermeister branded car that made the move out front in turn one. Then it was number 5090, Chris Lazenby and the number 5022 Kelson Motorsports team. Lazenby zipped out front of Kelson into turn one. The trophy light trucks took off next. Greg Bragg got a great start and zoomed past Joe Hurling. Then it was Joe Fittos who went door to door with KJ Hawkins out of Mesa, Arizona. Joe squeezed out front early on. Travis Williams got in front of Jason Bergstrom off the start next and looked fast. Then it was Chris Wardle who took the whole shot on Larry Schmoozer. Chris placed fourth in the 2018 Trophy Light Points Championship and was looking to pick up points early on this year. Rick Hurling from La Quinta, California got out ahead of David Carey from McCall, Idaho to round out the Trophy Light class. The class 2000 cars came flying off the start next, followed by the Pro Unlimited UTVs a handful of fast 1100 cars, and a slew of gorgeous vintage race cars and trucks. The vintage class is near and dear to the off-road community, and the Mint 400 is lucky to have so many wonderful restored vintage vehicles racing each year. There were some awesome looking 7100 trucks that took off next, as well as a strong showing from the Jeep Speed 3700, 2700, and 1700 classes. The Sportsman UTVs came through right ahead of the UTV Rally Class next. Many of the Rally Class racers were competing for their first time. Then it was the stock Volkswagen or Class 11 racers who each ripped off the start line. Chad Hall left the start line last in his full-size Chevy truck. Chad is the son of Rod Hall, an icon in the sport and pioneer in off-road engineering. A fitting way to start the 2019 Mint 400 Limited race. Up in the lead pack, Travis Chase was still out front as he charged hard towards chokers at race mile 23. But he was being chased by Neil Grabowski out of Alta Loma, California in his Crawford Performance built machine. Neil had already passed two cars on the course. Just behind the two leaders was Christian Fessler from Riverside, California in the number 5026 car. And Schweers and Atchison were still in the mix in fourth and fifth on the road with Belk right behind them. Minutes later, Greg Bragg came through and was still leading the trophy light pack, but number 6061 Joe Hurling was right on his tail. In the Pro Unlimited UTV class, Randy Rasheen was still in a battle up front with Michael Isom. Meanwhile, number 2011 Jay Reichert emerged from the dust with a lead in his class already. 
But Ted Baker wasn't about to give up as he charged down course after Jay. And Christy Sislove was right in the mix behind them both. It takes guts to pilot these little single-seat cars on such a rough course. Christy was showing how to get it done. 11-year-old Jack Oligas came through next. Jack made quick work of the whoops at Chokers and was showing the grown-ups how to get it done. Billy Bunch hit the lake bed in his old Dodge and made a quick pass to find clean air. Steve Oligas did the same thing a few minutes later. There are not many spots to pass safely at the Mint, so you have to plan your passing carefully. The Tommy Croft and Norm Francis rebuilt Chenoweth looked beautiful floating across the lake bed. Tommy was sitting in second place in class behind Pete Alessi as they approached the 23-mile mark. And Harley Lettner in the Concrete Motorsports 7100 truck was out for a stroll. There is no rule against pre-running day one to get a look at the course at the Mint. Harley wasn't the only big dog out there. Dan McMillan was out in his Polaris Razor in the rally class as well. Number 4537 Brady McDonald out of Rapid City, South Dakota was having a blast in his vintage racer. He was letting the race come right to him. Up in the lead pack, Travis Chase was still out front and in the lead by several minutes as he came through the Fox Proving Grounds at race mile 38. Chase is one of many desert racers that started out on motorcycles and moved to cars eventually. Neil Grabowski came through next and looked fast. He was putting the Subaru-powered machine to work. Christian Fessler came ripping through in third place still. He was racing with Steve Welker and Eric Irvine. So far, so good. Minutes later, it was Mike Belk out of San Diego in his Source Prep and Fab VW in fourth place on the road. Meanwhile, at the back of the pack, the Class 11 guys hit chokers. Rick Boyer was just ahead of Jorge Ventura. Then Eric Johnson came through a few minutes later physically in fourth on course. And in Jeep Speed 3, it was Will Heaton out front at the Fox Proving Grounds, followed closely by Scott Zierzanowski. They had a nice little lead, but the chase pack was not far behind. Minutes later, U-Theory Racing's Darren Root was quickly moving to the front of the pack in the UTV Rally class. At the halfway point of lap one, the Class 5000 order remained Travis Chase out front, Neil Grabowski in the number two spot, just ahead of Christian Fessler, then Mike Belk in fourth, and Chris Schwears, who rounded out the top five. Greg Bragg, meanwhile, held down the lead still in trophy light. He was a few minutes ahead of Travis Williams, followed by Joe Hurling, who came through shortly after. The lead pack of trucks had opened up a sizable gap ahead of the chase pack. Hailing from Phoenix, Arizona, Peter Alessi III came through 10 minutes later in the lead in the Vintage Open class, followed by his father, who was leading the second Vintage class. It was an Alessi takeover at the Mint so far. The lead pack hit the main pit, and it was Neil Grabowski who came in first. Neil had gotten past Travis Chase at race mile 63 and managed to hang on to the lead through the end of lap one. They stopped just long enough for fuel and then tore out of the pit just as Travis Chase pulled in. The trophy light racers were led out on their second lap by Greg Bragg and Travis Williams. Brett Comiskey led the 2900 UTV class, followed closely by Caden Wells in his new Polaris Razor Turbo S and Jay Reichert was still leading the 2000 class. Christy Sislove and Ted Baker were still in the hunt, though. Suddenly, up in front, there was a major lead change in the 5000 class. Neil Grabowski pulled over at race mile 20 with some mechanical issues and was forced to retire. Travis Chase and the rest of the lead pack got past him while he sat helplessly. Christian Fessler now sat in second behind Chase, followed by Mike Bell. Greg Bragg was still out front in trophy light. Thus far, he had led the entire race. And Steve Oligas was out in his beautiful Ford vintage truck dubbed Zorro. He was catching and passing trophy light trucks with his cheater motor. It was all in good fun, though. Travis Williams was still in the mix, and Billy Bunch was cruising right along. Brett Comiskey, who hails from Queensland, Australia originally, was being chased down by Caden Wells. U-Theory Racing's Darren Rood came flying through a few minutes later in first place. Back up front, the lead pack hit the Fox Proving Grounds for the second time. It was still Travis Chase out front, followed by Christian Fessler and Mike Bell. The race was now halfway over, but the course was becoming extremely battered and the sun was beginning to set. 
The last lap of the race would be in the pitch dark, adding yet another challenging element to the battle. 30 minutes later, the other class leaders came through the proving grounds, and in Jeep Speed 3, it was Eric Sigwing from Pahrump, Nevada, who had opened up a massive lead in his class. He was seven miles ahead of the next competitor on course and looked strong. Todd Walter came flying through a few minutes later out in front in the 7100 class. Hailing from the Dalles, Oregon, Todd and his co-driver Josh Fullenweider were getting it done in their Toyota truck. Meanwhile, in Vintage CT, John Griffin and Corey White from Mission Viejo, California were leading the pack. They had built up a nice five-mile lead on their second and final lap. A few minutes later, it was Roger Lovell in his old Ford Bronco who came through alongside Journey Richardson in Class 2000. Journey and her crew had moved into second place in class and were racing to raise money for charity to fight cancer. She made the rough stuff look easy. Jorge Ventura from Palm Springs, California came racing through next, leading the Class 11 stock VW field. There were 10 Class 11 racers at the Mint this year, a testament to the strength of this important historical class. Eric Palacios from Las Vegas was right on Jorge's tail, though, hoping for a chance to pass. And number 919, Ray Hank, was doing great in the UTV rally class. He was sitting in fourth on the road, but the racers in front of him were experiencing mechanical issues from pushing so hard. Minutes later, it was Nathan Thomas from Newcastle, Oklahoma, who came through leading the UTV sportsman class. Meanwhile, the Class 5000 and Trophy Light trucks had all made their final stop in the main pit and were already back out on course for lap three. Travis Chase ripped through the chewed up turn at race mile 23 known as Chokers, followed by Christian Fessler a few minutes later. Chris Lazenby was in third, but was 30 miles back still. Chase and Fessler were now in a race of their own. Greg Bragg and Travis Williams were still one and two in trophy light. They had broken away from the main pack and were running way out front as they went out on their third and final lap. Brett Comiskey still led the 2900 class at the start of lap three as well. For the next two hours, the two and three lap racers battled each other and mother nature. As the racers streamed across the finish line, their final timing was tallied. It was 39-year-old Travis Chase and his co-driver Jacob Loxon who finished first in Class 5000 and took the overall victory in the three-lap limited race. Jorge Ventura locked it up in Class 11. And U-Theory Racing's Darren Root took home the UTV Rally Class win. Honorable mentions go to Tommy Croft for making it to the finish line on three wheels and Jack Oligas, who took third place in the UTV Rally class at only 11 years of age. Way to go, Jack. Here's a look at all of the winners from this year's incredible Mint 400 Limited Race. Many of the race teams would end up racing very late into the night. Of the more than 100 that started, only 60% of them would finish, some just before the cutoff time. The never give up attitude of this sport is what makes it so remarkable. Off-road racing spans multiple generations and youth racing has been a part of the sport since its inception. Seth Quintero and his family launched their own race team several years ago and suddenly found themselves on top of the podium at the 2015 UTV World Championship. Three years later, Seth earned factory Polaris and Red Bull sponsorships, making him one of the youngest in history to do so. I've always grown up in a family where nothing's giving, everything's earned. Kind of transitioned over to racing, which was a, which was a good trait to have. Started off road racing when I was at a very young age, you know. Uh, always grew up in the desert, riding dirt bikes, hanging out with friends. My real experience was when I was four. Uh, my parents got me my first quad, and uh, dad started racing dirt bikes in the desert. So immediately I started racing my quad in the desert and uh, kind of started escalating from there. But uh, we've always been a desert family. When we put him on that bike and he got on the starting line, it was a moment we won't ever forget as a family. Um, we were there for fun, and here we are. <laughs> I started racing UTVs back in 2012. I was racing my 170 at local dirt series races kind of trying to have some fun and from there we started taking it a little bit more serious as we have a naturally competitive family. 
moved to 170s, was in there a couple years, and won the 2015 World Championship, 2015 Works Championship, and uh, then we just said, we're ready for the big dogs, and start, started to build 1,000, and all uphill from there. My relationship with my dad is definitely a little different. A lot of kids my age, they just want to be on their own, but uh, I need my dad around. He's a, a big sport, and uh, helps me out all the time. And just We fight sometimes, we throw wrenches at each other sometimes, but we always get it done. This last year, he's taken control, and there's been times where I'm handing him the tools, and it's handing him those tools with a smile. Like It's me and him, and I love it. So uh, last year was my first year racing the best in the desert, and uh, my expectations were just trying to like try to finish the races. You know, I didn't know what I was going up against. So I was going kind of blind. Coming into the mint was probably one of the most intimidating days of my life. You know, I came in with a car that we have barely driven. Me and my dad built it in our garage, and uh, we wanted to come out swinging, but expectations weren't the highest. And seeing all the guys with their fully built cars and uh, all the drivers that have been there for years, it was definitely intimidating. Like we had Kristen Matlock in there, we had Dodge Pullman in there, a bunch of the like fastest dudes out there, and I was going up against them. So going in was a little intimidating. To uh, maybe hopefully uh, be able to walk away with a class win at the mint would be insane, you know. Uh, 16 years old to do it, and just never in my wildest dreams would have thought I'd be competing at the mint and maybe in contention for a win. BF Gooders tires are probably one of the most important things in my desert racing program because uh, no flats equals me. You can drive with confidence, you know. You don't want to be getting out the car or changing a flat every couple hundred miles. Honestly, I just have so much trust in it that I, would, I couldn't pick any other tire, you know. Uh, I just have confidence driving with whether it's in the rocks or in the silt where I know there's sharp edges. Uh, just knowing that I have the best under me is a good feeling. This is just the beginning of my career, you know. I just started. I'm uh, only just a 16-year-old guy trying to work my way through. But uh, being a part of the BFG family at such a young age is uh, quite the experience, you know. I have all these amazing people around me to support me, and uh, it's definitely a learning curve. The most difficult part for our race team of racing is just uh, trying to get the time off work and school. You know, my parents both have full-time jobs and I'm in school full-time. You know, when I come home, work in the shop, I'm not out going to the pool, riding bikes, doing all the normal 16-year-old things, but uh, I come from a really competitive family and we always want to come out on top, so like, once I start one thing, I want to be the best in it. It's a teardropper when you see him on that line and take off and cross a checker flag no matter what position he comes in to see him start and finish those huge BITV races is it puts a smile on my face no matter what happens and I wouldn't change it for thing. My favorite part of the journey is just quality family time you know all my family comes to the races even my grandma's come to the races to come watch and uh, I'll come home and I see all my friends they like congratulate me or my teachers congratulate me or they follow me on Instagram and just uh, knowing that people recognize what I'm doing is pretty awesome. Sunday, March 10th, 5.30 a.m. It's the twilight hour of race day number two at the Mint 400, and over 150 racers were busy gathering their gear and preparing to race. The new two-day format meant that 21 Class 10 cars, 110 UTVs, 17 sportsman trucks, and a handful of Ultra 4s, 0-1s, and 7200s were all about to wage war. The biggest names in each class were all here. Lambert, Schuler, Scanlon, Jeff Proctor and the Honda team, and Matt Burroughs in his Monster Energy Beast. The seconds ticked down, and Bailey Hughes, the reigning Miss Mint 400, sent them off. Chase Warren and Christian Fessler led the Class 10s off the start line, followed by Brent Fox and Tanner James, then Cody Reed and Jared Teague, after the 10s came the Pro Turbo UTVs, and it was Brandon Schuler and Dustin Jones off first. Then Jacob Carver and former Mint 400 winner Brandon Sims. Austin Whelan and Randy Romo took off next. As the sun finally came up, it was time for the naturally aspirated UTVs. Seth Quintero led the group off the line. There were 34 naturally aspirated UTVs racing in all. And UFC star Kane Velasquez led the 0-1 cars off the line next. Right behind Kane were the sportsman racers with some of the coolest trucks at the race this year. 
Up front, the lead pack of 10 cars had hit the Fox Proving Grounds and Christian Fessler was now out front by a few minutes. Number 1088 Chase Warren was right behind him though, holding down second place so far. Number 1080 Tanner James sat in third place. Meanwhile, back at race mile 23, Dustin Jones had moved out front in Pro Turbo UTV. He was being followed closely though by Jacob Carver and Brandon Schuler. The lead pack had opened up about a one minute lead over Brandon Sims, who sat in fourth. Up in the lead class 10 pack, number 1003 Christian Fessler was still out front and running strong, but Chase Warren was right on his tail and making up ground fast. At race mile 79, just after pit B, Warren got around Fessler and took the lead. Tanner James, meanwhile, was sitting a few minutes back in third place still. In the naturally aspirated UTV class, Brett Ward had moved out front but was being chased down by young Seth Quintero. This was the second Mint 400 for Seth and he was coming off a big win at the first race of the season. John Estrada out of Phoenix, Arizona came through next. Jeff Proctor, meanwhile, was setting a great pace in their Honda-powered Ridgeline truck. In the Pro Turbo race, number 978 Dustin Jones was still in a commanding lead ahead of number 919 Brandon Schuler. Number 931 Craig Scanlon, meanwhile, was hammering down trying to catch the lead pack. Right near Scanlon, number 951 Mitch Guthrie Jr. was gaining positions fast. He had moved from 18th to 7th in a mere 50 miles. Also in the mix early on was number 944, Phil Blurton. Phil started 33rd off the line and by race mile 50 had passed 16 cars. He was in the top five on corrected time and running down the chase pack. Monster Energy's Casey Curry was looking good on lap one in his Ultra 4 car. He had opened up a seven mile lead over Jay Calloway. Meanwhile, the class 10 leaders had hit the main pit. Christian Fessler was still sitting in second place as he pulled in for fuel. Number 978, Dustin Jones from Bossier City, Louisiana, had maintained a commanding lead on lap one in his S3 Power Sports Can-Am. He got fresh tires and fuel and was out of his pit in less than a minute. Number 954, Austin Whelan, sat in second place coming into the main pit, but third place Randy Romo did not opt to stop. Instead, he passed Whelan and moved into second following Jones out of the prim infield. Meanwhile, number 903 Seth Quintero came through the main pit in first place, ahead of number 1817 Brett Ward. Up ahead in class 10, 29-year-old Chase Warren was now clear of the infield on lap two and racing down towards chokers. Their Warren Brothers racing Alumicraft car was soaking up the rough mint course and they were making it look way too easy. But number 1003, Christian Fessler, wasn't about to give up. He was mere seconds behind Warren as they hit race mile 23. Further back in the chase pack, number 1080, Pete Agis, was still running strong as well. Dustin Jones hit chokers a few minutes later and was still in the lead. After the shakeup at race mile 11, Austin Whelan and Sierra Romo were in second and third physically. However, the entire lead pack was now being hunted down by a former Mint 400 champion, a UTV world champion, a two-time King of the Hammers champion, and a Baja 1000 champion. Mitch Guthrie Jr. sat in fourth but was winning on corrected time. And if that wasn't bad enough, number 944 Phil Blurton was sitting in eighth physically and was seconds off the lead on corrected time. Kane Velasquez was doing terrific on the end of his opening lap. He moved into second physically and looked smooth. Meanwhile, Rich Voss had moved out front in the sportsman class ahead of Tony Scott. Warren and Fessler continued to run one and two as they headed past the Fox Proving Grounds. Cody Reed out of Apple Valley, California, meanwhile, was running third physically and looked fast. Arnoldo Gutierrez came through in fourth place next, followed by Peter Agis, who was running strong in fifth still. At the halfway mark of lap two in the Pro Turbo class, Dustin Jones was still in the physical lead. Austin Whelan was still in his mirror, holding down second. But Mitch Guthrie Jr. had now passed another car on course and was catching Whelan fast. Back in the naturally aspirated UTV class, Seth Quintero continued to battle with Brett Ward. Art Anderson, who held down third. Number 4402 Casey Curry was having a flawless day in the Ultra 4 class. Number 917 Jason Murray had now worked himself into 14th place physically after starting 42nd. 
and number 944 Phil Blurton was now in seventh place physically on course and trading for the overall lead on corrected time with Mitch Guthrie. The Class 10 leaders hit the main pit at the end of their second lap, and it was still Chase Warren out front by a few minutes. Christian Fessler pulled in right behind Warren and was also in and out in a matter of seconds. Peter Ajas, meanwhile, hit the main pit in fourth but lost a few spots during his pit. Dustin Jones came in to pit next. Number 954 Andrew Whelan got around Jones in the pit and Andrew did not stop. He was now physically in the lead. Jones got back on the course right behind him. And Mitch Guthrie moved into third behind Jones as they left the infield and headed back out into the desert. But minutes later, Mitch Guthrie caught and passed Dustin Jones on the dry lake bed and moved into second physically. He was now running down Whelan. Meanwhile, up in the lead Class 10 pack, Chase Warren remained out front still as he blasted through the Fox Proving Grounds. Christian Fessler remained right on his bumper. Number 1020 Connor McMullen had quietly emerged out of the dust in third place. Casey Curry was continuing his impressive run and was virtually uncontested as he started his third lap. And Honda's Jeff Proctor blasted across the dry lake bed light years ahead of the next 7200 truck on course. Rich Voss had opened up a commanding 30-mile lead on the Sportsman Pack and showed no signs of slowing down. Back in the Pro Turbo UTV class, Mitch Guthrie made the pass for the lead right before the Fox Proving Grounds. Austin Whelan and Dustin Jones sat in second and third, but they were running out of time fast. Up ahead, Chase Warren was now battling severe lap traffic to maintain his lead heading into the finish. Christian Fessler was right behind him. Connor McMullen continued to hold down third place. The seconds ticked down and the Class 10 leaders hit the prim start finish line. First across was Chase Warren, who finished with a time of 5 hours, 52 minutes, and 11 seconds. In the Pro Turbo UTV class, it was Mitch Guthrie Jr. who would take the checkers and become one of the select few racers to ever win the Mint 400 twice in their career. Young Seth Quintero crossed the finish line first in the naturally aspirated Pro UTV class. Here's a look at all of the winners from this year's incredible Mint 400 Day 2 Limited Race. For Jensen Button, life is about testing himself. And this year he teamed up with Brenthal Industries and jumped into a brand new unlimited spec truck in preparation for the Great American Off-Road Race. So we're here in Barstow. This is the part that I don't normally stop in, but here we are today in the middle of the desert driving these monsters. So this is all new to me. We're here with Brenthal Industries. We're practicing. It's my first ever test off-road in anything because we're going to be racing the mid 400. Um, in, in a few weeks. I've been racing on a track for 30 years. You know, most of my life has been with a steering wheel in my hands with four wheels. And I come to this and it's totally like a duck out of water. I've always thought that challenging yourself in life is the most important thing. And this is definitely that. You know, I understand it has four wheels, so it's going to have the same sort of feeling as on a track, but there's three feet of suspension travel. You're airborne half the time, and this is all completely new to me, so so alien. So this is a real passion project, and I just got a hope that I like it now. But we're going to see in about an hour's time whether I come back and go, you know what, that ain't for me. <laughs> but I'm sure from what the guys say, that, that isn't going to be the case. Looking forward to getting out there and hopefully the Brentel brothers, Jonathan and Jordan, will show us a thing or two and we won't arrive at the Mint 400 completely confused and scared of what, what to expect. Oh mate, unreal, but we got a lot of learning. Yeah. I'm not sure we're going to be ready for the Mint. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious. For the second year in a row, the City of Las Vegas and Mayor Goodman's office officially declared the first week of March as Mint 400 Race Week, in honor of the impact the famed races continue to have on the city and state. On Wednesday, the 7th annual Mint 400 Ignite CBD vehicle procession roared down the Las Vegas Strip with over 150 race vehicles and bikes. An estimated $30 million worth of off-road machinery wowed the massive Las Vegas crowds. 
Thanks to the generous support of Ignite, the parade started at the Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino and wheeled its way all the way down to historic Fremont Street, which was renamed Mint 400 Boulevard for the second year in a row. Later that evening, the Martelli brothers hosted the second annual Dinner of Champions with some of the greatest champions of off-road racing from the past and the present, including J.N. Roberts, K.J. Howe, Larry Rossler, Rob McCachran, Justin Lofton, and Casey Curry. Guests of the event were treated to a fantastic gourmet meal with wine and mezcal tastings, all while rubbing elbows with some of off-road racing's living legends. On Thursday, the Mint 400 Off-Road Festival, powered by Rockford Fosgate, once again took over historic Fremont Street East and featured the biggest and best off-road showcase in North America. Half of the 550 Mint 400 entrants slowly pushed past over 250 vendors that lined 12 blocks and filled the entire neighborhood. Each of the race vehicles underwent a technical safety inspection to prepare them for the race and well over 25,000 off-road enthusiasts showed up to shop for off-road parts, get autographs, and meet their favorite drivers. Down here you know, on Fremont Street for the uh, 2019 Men 400 uh, Tech and Contingency, uh, awesome turnout, weather's uh, been amazing so far. We got a little sprinkle, got a little sunshine, so great turnout, having a lot of fun. Later that night, it was the eighth annual Method Race Wheels Pit Crew Challenge. Unlimited truck and unlimited spec truck teams faced off for bragging rights. Go! The unlimited spec trucks kicked off the festivities, with eight teams going head-to-head -head in round one. Team Householder took out the Lund team after a heated battle that came right down to the wire. JVRP bested the Scanlon Motorsports crew in their quarterfinal heat. Camberg fell to F-Series after a very close call and Team Lovell beat RPM out of the gate and advanced to the next round. The reigning champions Householder Motorsports put the kibosh on JVRP in the semis and secured their spot in the final round. Meanwhile, F-Series and Lovell went toe-to-toe. -to -toe. It came down to the wire and Lovell eked out the win, setting up an exciting final round. Southern California's Householder Motorsports went to the mat in the finals against Team Lovell out of Colorado Springs. It was the reigning champs against the up-and-comers. Both teams pulled out all the stops and duked it out. They both hit the buzzer seemingly at the same time, but when referee Tony Vanillo checked all the lugs, Team Lovell had one loose nut, and it cost their team the win. Householder Motorsports would remain the champs for the second year in a row. Next up, it was the big dogs. Eight unlimited trucks each rolled up to battle it out. In the semis, Justin Lofton's Ah Beef team went to war with Team Graf and bumped them out of the competition. Then it was off-road champion Jason Voss who took on Team Herbst. Voss Motorsports came out ahead by a mere six-tenths of a second and moved on. Las Vegas local BJ Baldwin took on the U-Theory team and his crew bested the boys from California. And Rob McCachran and his local boys went toe-to-toe -to -toe with another set of locals and former pit crew challenge winners, Team Ford. Rob and his team got it done and moved on to the next round. In the semifinal round, two-time Mint 400 champion Justin Lofton went up against Jason Voss. Lofton's crew looked fast, but Team Voss was able to shave a few seconds off their best time and took out the champ. Then Monster Energy's Team Baldwin went up against Rockstar Energy's Team McCachran, and after a superheated battle, the boys in yellow would advance to the finals. The final championship round was set. Voss Motorsports against Team McCachran. The buzzer sounded and both teams attacked their trucks. The battle was a testament to just how skilled unlimited truck pit crews must be to be competitive while the 54.42 second time that McCachran's squad laid down was impressive, it was just no match for Voss Motorsports, whose 53.85 second stop was good enough to secure the win, bragging rights, and all the prizes. Day two of the Rockford Fosgate Mint 400 Off-Road Festival saw an even bigger turnout as the rest of the 550 racers pushed through crowded Fremont Street. In all, some 40,000 people packed the street over two days, 
making the event one of the largest on the Las Vegas calendar. It was an epic buildup to the most anticipated race of the year. Sunday, 1 p.m., 45 unlimited trucks, 18 Class 1 cars, 49 unlimited spec trucks, and a handful of 6,200 trucks all lined up at the inaugural Mint 400 Gridwalk. The Gridwalk is the age-old tradition of parking racers in front of the main grandstands minutes before the start of a race. Normally, only a select few members of the race teams are allowed on the track. However, this year, Mint 400 race owners Matt and Josh Martelli and event manager Killian Hamlin made the call to allow all of the Mint 400 fans who were present at the official Prim Valley start-finish line access to the grid. What happened next truly epitomized the spirit of off-road racing. Fans, family, and friends were all able to wish their favorite drivers good luck, get their autographs, and take photos while the team did a last-minute equipment check. Yeah, we went out in um, an 8100 truck, took a look at the course this morning, and uh, it's going to be fun. It's good, rocky, uh, a lot of moisture in the ground, so it's going to make for some good racing. Minutes later, the team strapped back in as the final seconds ticked down. Bryce Menzies sat at the front of the pack in his brand new four-wheel drive unlimited truck. He had earned the coveted pole position for being fastest qualifier. Between the start-finish area and the remote spectator spots, there were over 25,000 off-road race fans on hand, all excited to see the action. The lights went green and Bryce was off. He quickly tore through the infield section, putting his short course racing experience and extra traction to work. The 2019 BF Goodrich Tires Mint 400 Unlimited Race was underway. At the Mint 400, the racers go door to door off the start line through the first few turns every 60 seconds. In row two, it was two-time Mint 400 champion Andy McMillan in his Red Bull truck on the inside against the seasoned off-road veteran Tim Herbst running Monster on the outside. Tim knew better than to risk his race early on and tucked behind Andy heading into turn one. The Herbst family have been instrumental in helping the Mint 400 grow to the record-breaking size that it is today. Up next, it was two-time Mint 400 champ Justin Lofton against Harley Lettner, driving for Concrete Motorsports. The two stayed neck and neck, rubbing doors into turn one. Then Harley managed to squeeze out front. But as they checked up for turn two, Justin dove inside and got around Harley. Rob McCachran in the number 11 Rockstar Energy Makita Tools truck went off next to Brett Serapis in the number 88 Coors Light truck in row four. Brett carried his speed better through the first two jumps and managed to make it out front. Then it was Cody Parkhouse in his cherry red Parkhouse Motorsports Class 1 buggy next to Luke McMillan in the number 83 Unlimited truck. Luke tucked inside on the entrance to turn one, forcing Parkhouse to let off the gas. Technically, they were both racing for an overall win, but Cody had a Class 1 race to stay focused on as well. You can't win the Mint 400 in turn one, but you can definitely lose it. Minutes later, it was Monster Energy's BJ Baldwin off the start line against James Dean in his Class 1 buggy. Dean broke very late coming into the turn and held his line for the lead ahead of BJ. Both racers knew from experience that they had six hours of racing ahead of them. Justin Davis and Ryan Pullman came flying by next, followed by CJ Hutchins and Eric Harden out of Irvine, California. Former Mint 400 Class 1 champion Sam Barry tore past Raul Gomez minutes later. Barry was one of the few single-seat Class 1 cars racing this year. Two by two, the rest of the Unlimited and Class 1 racers ripped off the start line and through the Python. They headed due north this year out of Prim and into the roughest and most challenging desert race course in America. The unlimited spec trucks lined up at the start next, and it was Brock Hedger driving for Method Race Wheels who came screaming out of the gates first. Brock had the fastest qualifying time for his class and had earned an uncontested start. Troy Messer from Kingman, Arizona, and Adam Ray Lund from Argyle, Texas took off in row two. Hildebrand and Kleinman, both from California, flew past next. Blade was in the Speed Energy truck and got the edge on David. Meanwhile, 
Sarah Price blasted off the start line minutes later and bested Brian Simmer into turn one. The unlimited spec race was already shaping up. Number 6191, Craig Scanlon, meanwhile, took off on his second race of the day. He had finished 20th in Pro Turbo UTV in the morning's race and was now headed out to try and Ironman another 400 miles in unlimited spec, something no other racer in history has ever done. At the back of the start pack was Jensen Button, who was competing in the first desert race of his career. He managed to best Kelly MacArthur into turn one, and the two were followed by a handful of 6200 class racers. There were now over 100 unlimited trucks hurling through the desert at breakneck speeds. Meanwhile, back up front, Bryce Menzies was still comfortably in the lead. He came screaming across the prim dry lake bed at 140 miles per hour in a hail of dirt and dust. He then checked up for the thick ruts at Chokers, but only briefly before stepping on the gas and tearing off again. Behind Bryce was his Red Bull teammate Andy McMillan. Both he and Andy wanted to be the first three-time Mint 400 champion. But to finish first, first you must finish, and that meant surviving nearly 400 miles of hell. Andy blasted through chokers and down course. Tim Herbst came through next. He had managed to do a little body work to the truck in the first 10 miles of the race. Thankfully, his Herb Smith unlimited truck was built like a tank. After Tim, it was Justin Lofton, then Harley Lettner, who was followed closely by Brett Serapis and Rob McCachran. Rob was playing sweep on the lead pack for now. Back in the chase pack, Luke McMillan was running strong still. He was averaging 104 miles per hour and was sitting in the top five on corrected time. Cody Parkhouse was right behind him. Cody was already leading class one by a large margin. Then it was Jason Voss who took a wide outside line through the turn. He was 90 seconds ahead of Ryan Arciero in the Levi's Unlimited truck, followed closely by Justin Matney in the number one RPM truck. Minutes later, Bryce Menzies was in and out of pit A and working his way through the Fox Proving Grounds. There was no need to stop for fuel or tires. Losing even 45 seconds at the Mint to an unscheduled pit stop was almost impossible to recover from. McMillan came through next. He was still in second place, but had dropped back two miles behind Bryce. The two-time Mint 400 champ seemed to find that elusive middle ground of being fast, but light on the equipment, a zone that everyone in the sport aspired to find. But if he wasn't careful, Bryce could run away. He needed to apply pressure forward or risk letting Bryce go unchallenged. Meanwhile, Justin Lofton had moved past Tim Herbst after he was forced to stop at pit A and was now in third place on the road. There were three two-time Mint 400 champions in first, second, and third place at the moment. Harley Lettner had also passed Herbst in pit A and was now running down Justin Lofton in the number 70 concrete motorsports truck owned by Kevin Thompson. Tim was still in the hunt, however, and was just ahead of number 88 Brett Serapis. But Brett had Rob McCachran in his rearview mirror. And as everyone in the sport knows, Rob is not the guy you want behind you. The chalky Nevada desert was now buzzing with the sound of unlimited trucks headed towards the spectator areas in Gene. McCachran ripped past 2,000 off-road race fans in a matter of seconds. Luke McMillan came through the Fox Proving Grounds next followed closely by Cody Parkhouse, who was still leading Class 1. Jason Voss, meanwhile, tried jumping over the entire five-mile stretch in one fell swoop. But gravity got in the way after takeoff. Voss made skipping through the landmines look easy. Our Sierra was still holding down 10th in the unlimited truck class. Jesse Jones had been battling with U-Theory Racing's Anthony Terzo, and the veteran racer finally made the pass just before the proving grounds. Jesse Jones is one of the sport's most understated racers and is a dark horse at any of the big off-road races. Back up front at race mile 50, the lead pack hit the shooting range. Bryce Menzies remained out front with a comfortable one-mile lead over Andy McMillan. But Andy was exactly where he wanted to be, hunting. Justin Lofton, meanwhile, had made up some time and sat just outside of Andy's dust trail. 
but it was Ledner who was an early standout on lap one. Harley had been here before, in a class one buggy, and watched it slip away. He was now squarely in fourth, biding his time. Number 88, Brett Serapis, had moved past Tim Herbst into fifth on the road and was leading the chase pack. BJ Baldwin was a few miles back in his Monster Energy Unlimited truck. BJ was another top contender as the Las Vegas native grew up riding these very trails as a kid. He was sitting in the top 10 on corrected time. Meanwhile, back in the unlimited spec class, Brock Hedger hit chokers and remained out front with clear air. Adam Lund sat in second place on course, followed by Troy Messer and number 6106 Blade Hildebrand. David Kleiman was still in fifth place, but he was being run down by the hungry Sarah Price. A.J. Jones was looking strong so far. Travis Chase, meanwhile, had managed to pick up a few spots early on, as had Taylor Mills, who looked strong, coming through race mile 25. Up in the lead pack at pit B, there was a shakeup. Andy McMillan was forced to pit due to a tire puncture, but he had Justin Lofton right on his tail. He knew Justin would likely slip by him, but there was nothing he could do. Stopping to fix the flat on his own would take two to three times as long. Andy pulled into his pit and sure enough, Lofton got past him. However, the McMillan Racing pit crew changed the flat in less than a minute, and Andy did not give up another position. Brock Hedger was now pulling away from the rest of the unlimited spec field. He was two miles ahead of Adam Lunn who sat in second. Both Hedger and Lunn had already passed nearly 10 of the slower unlimited trucks. Brock won the Mint last year in Class 10 and was showing incredible promise in his new truck. Back in the chase pack, Chuck Dempsey came through the proving grounds with too much gas. He bucked his truck and went for a tumble. He and his co-driver were okay though, and were back racing again a few minutes later, but not before Terry Householder snuck by them. AJ Jones came through minutes later. He was still running in the top 10. Jensen Button, meanwhile, was having a good day thus far. He was moving at a solid pace for his first desert race ever. The only thing he needed to worry about was being caught by the leaders on their second lap. The race leaders came through the Joshua Tree Highway and it was still Menzies out front. Cody Parkhouse, meanwhile, remained in the top 10 and was several miles ahead of the next Class 1 car. Up ahead, the race leaders hit the main pit. As the drivers took on fuel and fresh tires, the order remained Bryce Menzies out front, followed by Justin Lofton, Andy McMillan, then Harley Lettner, Brett Serapis, Rob McAchran, Luke McMillan, then Class 1 leader Cody Parkhouse, Jason Voss, and Ryan Arciero. Jesse Jones came through the main pit shortly after the leaders. Normally, he and his son AJ shared driving duties, but for a race as big as the Mint, they decided to double their odds and each run their own truck this year. The father and son team of Jesse and AJ Jones have only been racing together for several years. But in that short amount of time, the two have racked up some impressive wins. Jesse had a very successful career as an off-road racer, but it's been his son AJ's success recently that has brought him the most joy. I originally got into off-road racing by my dad introducing it to me. He always told me whenever you go off and do whatever you're gonna do, you know, racing will be here for you. I think it was about two years ago, I put him in the co-dog seat and we just started racing. And honestly, after the first two races, I made a deal with him and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll drive until I get a flat tire. And when I get a flat, I'll get out, change it, you drive until you get a flat, and then I get to drive again. And just the time that we've gotten to spend together is unbelievable. If, if I can have Austin excel and be a champion, that's all I want. We'd be sitting there and go through a crazy section or be going really fast through something we shouldn't have been going that fast through, and we just look at each other and start laughing. You know, we just have the greatest times. You always wonder whether or not your children are going to be really good at something and to see him evolve and become a, a racer, I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of him. Up until we won the Baja 500, uh, it, it was always kind of a dream, you know. And then once we won the 500, that really was like, whoa, we're not trying to do this, we can do this.
a lot of our success is because we're not always knocking off tires like a lot of people are. It used to be the tires, you look at a rock kind of and you would get a sidewall flat. And today we can bang our way through rocks and with proper management get the tires to go 300 miles. So to see them be able to do a 200% improvement is really unbelievable. I've always wanted to win the Mint. I think that that's the coolest race that there is in America, the most prestigious one by far. We're going to do everything we possibly can to go for it this year. In the spring of 2017, the Mint 400 formed a new and exciting partnership with Republic Services, which led to the first ever Republic Services Dash for Trash event and the first annual Mint 400 Desert Cleanup. Those two events resulted in the removal of over 36,000 pounds of waste from the critical habitat area in Gene, Nevada. This year, for the second annual Desert Cleanup, Republic increased their generous support and over 200 volunteers showed up to help restore parts of the Mint 400 race course and OHV area. We're out here in Jean, Nevada. This is our third consecutive cleanup uh, partnership between the Mint 400 and Republic Services. We're out here because Gene is a high visibility OHV area. We got a lot of visitors, a lot of recreational users that come out here, but unfortunately there's a lot of illegal dumping that takes place. What we've seen many, many years is that to the general public, they see the off-roaders out here using the land and think that they go hand in hand with the illegal dumping. When it's actually counter that, these off-road folks are spending their time coming out here because they know and they see the issue every day that they come out here to have fun. So it's really up to them. These cleanups wouldn't happen without them. They're a tremendous part of this effort and we really thank them for everything that they do. In the past two events, we've brought out about 15 containers, and today we've brought out eight additional 30-yard containers. Collectively, between the last two events, we've removed over 70,000 pounds of garbage. All these specialty interest groups from Vegas come out on their Saturday, spend their time volunteering to make sure that we're taking care of our public lands, and it's a tremendous effort. We're really proud of what they do and what we've accomplished together as a partnership, and it's honestly one of the most fun events that I've ever been a part of. Dozens of off-road companies donated raffle prizes to the event to help reward the participants. The Southern Nevada BLM office chipped in with tools and supplies, and the Motorsports Safety Solutions team was on hand to help keep things safe. It's lap two of the Unlimited race, and over 100 off-road warriors have been battling the Mint 400 race course for over two hours. 25 vehicles have already succumbed to mechanical issues and are out of the race. But Bryce Menzies, the race leader, was not slowing down one bit. Menzies, who was first off the line, led the entire first lap and was already through his pit and back out on the race course. Behind him was two-time Mint 400 champion Justin Lofton, who had managed to get around third place Andy McMillan on the first lap when Andy pulled in to swap a flag. Just behind McMillan was number 70, Harley Lettner, in the concrete motorsports truck. And then it was number 88, Brett Serapis, followed by number 11, Rob McCacker. One by one, the racers hammered through the prim infield and back out into the desert. In class one, number 1532, Cody Parkhouse, was still out front in the lead and had opened up a sizable gap ahead of Justin Davis. But CJ Hutchins and James Dean were still lurking in the backfield and this was not the time for Cody to let off the gas. One by one, the racers ripped down course and threw chokers at race mile 23. Luke McMillan was still in the hunt, leading the chase pack as he came through. And Jason Voss came skipping past, eighth in class. Ryan Arciero was still in the chase pack in his Levi's Unlimited truck. And Jesse Jones was right behind him, rounding out the top 10. Meanwhile, back in Unlimited spec, Brock Hedger was continuing his domination in the class and passing many of the bigger, unlimited trucks ahead of him. He was nine miles ahead of the next two trucks in his class at this point. Minutes later, the pack passed through chokers, and it was still Hedger up front with Adam Lunn in second. But Taylor Mills had gotten around David Kleinman, who was having engine troubles. Number 6118 Ryan Hancock came through minutes later in hot pursuit, 
followed closely by Travis Chase. Chase had already put in three laps of racing on Saturday, winning the Class 5000 race. A second class win here on Sunday would rank him among a select few to ever win two classes at the Mint in the same weekend, but it was a long race to go yet. Number 1535, Bailey Campbell was having a good race so far in her Monster Energy Class 1 buggy. She was sitting in fifth in class at the moment. Back up front, Bryce Menzies hit the Fox Proving Grounds. His four-wheel drive unlimited truck had run flawlessly all day as he neared the halfway point of the race. The number 60 unlimited truck of Cole Potts suddenly emerged from the dust. Potts was down a lap from some mechanical gremlins, so the team put in a ringer. Robbie Gordon now sat behind the wheel of the Geyser Brothers' built machine. The chase pack order remained the same at race mile 39. Justin Lofton sat in second just ahead of Andy McMillan. Both two-time Mint 400 champions were being chased by Harley Lettner, Brett Serapis, and Rob McCachran. Cody Parkhouse was absolutely on the gas and leading his class by a huge margin, but he nearly threw it all away after hitting a massive G out that sent the front of his buggy sky high for a split second. He never lifted. Sam Baldy, meanwhile, was having a solid day of racing, despite doing a little bit of body work early on. And Tim Herbst was still in the race as well, although he had fallen back a few spots. Remarkably, Brock Hedger came through a few minutes later and was 24th physically overall. He had passed nearly 20 unlimited trucks on the road and would soon crack the top 20 in a vehicle with far less power than the class above him. At the halfway point of lap two, there was a shakeup in the chase pack. Bryce Menzies remained out front ahead of Justin Lofton and Andy McMillan. But Kevin Thompson, now driving in the Concrete Motorsports Unlimited truck, was forced to pull over for a flat tire and he was passed by number 88, Serapis, and number 11, Rob Mack. For Serapis, it was just the break he was hoping for, as he looked ahead to now try to catch McMillan. But Thompson wasn't giving up at all. He mashed the gas pedal and got right back in the game. Parkhouse came through next and was still in the lead in Class 1. However, number 1501, James Dean from Henderson, Nevada, had now closed the massive gap and was within about 10 minutes of the class leader. Up ahead at race mile 61, the lead pack caught and passed Robbie Gordon in the number 60 unlimited truck of Cole Potts. Gordon got back on the road just ahead of Kevin Thompson, who tailed him for several miles before passing him cleanly. But a few miles later, Robbie gave Thompson the old freshman special and sent Kevin over a berm and off the course. He recovered and stayed in front of Gordon, but was forced to pull over again in remote pit B to fix the damage to his truck. It was a tough break for the Concrete Motorsports team that had fought so hard to start up front. Catching Bryce for the overall win was slipping away quickly. Brock Hedger, meanwhile, ripped down the race course a full 11 miles ahead of the next competitor in his class. At this point, it was Hedger's race to win or lose. Taylor Mills had moved into second physically and was enjoying clean air. All he could do was hope that Brock would make a mistake. Travis Chase, however, had moved into third and was making up ground fast on both Mills and Hedger. Ryan Hancock was behind Chase in fourth place. And it was Sarah Price who now sat in fifth place, less than two minutes behind Hancock at the halfway point of the race, while Adam Lund was still mixing it up in sixth on course. Up ahead, the race leaders were making their final push through the Joshua Tree Highway. The lead order remained the same. It was Bryce, Justin, Andy, Brett, and Rob, any of whom could now win this race with a little bit of luck. Meanwhile, Kevin Thompson was back on the road making up time. He was determined to crack the top five again. And U-Theory Racing's Anthony Terzo came through with some power in his swagger. For BJ Baldwin, however, today just wasn't his day. He ripped off the rear half of his truck and was forced to concede defeat to the Mint this year. But it wasn't just BJ. By the end of lap two, nearly 50 trucks lay destroyed on the Mint 400 race course, which was now battered beyond recognition. And if that wasn't enough, it was about to get very, very dark. The road to the Mint 400 start line is unique for every racer. For Sarah Price, it began at the age of eight when she put her leg over a motorcycle for the first time. After a decade of hard riding, she moved into the UTV class where she competed around the globe, earning dozens of wins and accolades. 
but it was Sarah's move into stadium super trucks that caught the attention of RPM off-road owner Clyde Stacy. And it wasn't long before Sarah found herself behind the wheel of a brand new unlimited spec truck. When I was eight years old and I first put my leg over a motorcycle, my goal was to turn professional. I become a factory racer. I medal in X Games. Our series is on TV. It's looking like there's a light at the end of the tunnel to really make a career out of this and a living. Then when they took out Women Super X and X Games, there's kind of like, okay, makes it really difficult to be a professional athlete in a sport that there's so many um, circumstances of being able to get hurt and even die. I've had three shoulder reconstructions, like how many more can I take? My parents sat me down and they're like, you're not making money doing this, like we need to figure this out. I didn't know who I was as a person. I didn't know what I was gonna do in my life. I, I got up and I made the right moves and I'm so grateful I did because a lot of people don't get out of that hole. And I started a business in the process of it. Starting the business and actually getting on my two feet, I was like, okay, like I, I want to go racing again, you know? Like I, I craved and I fiend for that adrenaline. I'm like addicted to it. So then I, I bought my first Polaris Razor and I started racing. I've done so many disciplines in the UTVs from traveling to Africa, racing one of the toughest all-female sporting events, to short course, to rock crawling, to you name it, we probably did in a UTV. I had worked a lot and saved up a little bit of money and I decided to put pretty much every penny I had in my savings towards racing the SST truck. I ended up going out there, honestly doing really good in the SSTs. And then I got a phone call from Clyde Stacy. He had watched me racing the stadium super trucks and he's like, I would love to see you in one of our trucks. So my first race was Laughlin Desert Classic. We did a really good job and then Clyde's like, hey, we're gonna make our little truck, the 6100, uh, your designated truck. I had my first year last year racing it, and me and Erica, we put in a lot of work, and we proved that we are here to compete. Having BF Goodrich tires on your vehicle is such an advantage. You do not want to be on the side of the track changing a tire, because you will not win. That is something that I've chosen to align myself with a company like BF Goodrich because of that. They have the best product out there, and nothing lines up next to it. Everything I do, I put a million percent into, and that's exactly what we've done with the truck. Honestly, I felt like me and Erica, we were on point as driving, putting in the time, doing everything we possibly needed to do to be competitive and to be in the top spot. I just, I want that win so bad, because we, we've been so close, but we just haven't had it, and I know it's only been a year and a half of the truck, but this is our year, I think. This is my first ever Mint 400, and I didn't think I'd ever race the Mint 400. It's awesome. Like, they take over Vegas, and it's like, for once, off-road is the forefront. So being a part of BF Goodrich is an incredible thing to be a part of their team, because not only do you have the most greatest racers of all time, like Rob Mack or Abdali Lopez, you know, my whole team, RPM, we're part of BFG. When you go down to any race, if it's Baja or if it's at the Millie, you have the most support. I sacrifice a lot in my life for racing. There's a lot of times where I'm kind of like, damn, like how am I gonna do this? But it's a hard road being an athlete in a sport that you don't have funds to do. So it's awesome to see like companies actually come on board and help me pursue my dream and my passion to uh, continue to do this. I want to go out there and compete. I'm a racer. I'm not just a female. I, I'm not just a pretty face. When you put on that helmet, you're a racer and be a racer.
It was the end of lap two at the 2019 Mint 400 Unlimited Race, and the massive pack of over 100 teams had been at war for over four hours. An incredible 50 trucks had succumbed to mechanical failure thus far, and the lead pack of racers had just hit the main pit at the end of lap two. They were preparing for their third and final lap in the pitch dark. Third place, Andy McMillan pulled into his pit, refueled his truck and replaced the rear tires in a mere 25 seconds. He was just behind second place, Justin Lofton and race leader, Bryce Menzies. There was no margin for error at the Mint any longer. In the end, it would come down to seconds. Unlimited spec class leader, Brock Hedger came into pit. He got a full set of fresh wheels, tires and gas while his crew raced to keep him out front. He was sitting 20 minutes ahead of second place Taylor Mills and nearly 45 minutes ahead of Travis Chase. Still, anything can happen at the Mint, and there was no time to waste. The race leaders ripped through the infield and back out onto the course for their final lap. It was Bryce Menzies in the number seven Red Bull Unlimited truck, followed closely by Justin Lofton in the number 41 Fox truck. Andy McMillan, racing for Red Bull and Toyo tires, was in third place, followed by Rob McCachran in his number 11 Rockstar Energy Makita machine. Rob had moved past Brett Serapis in the number 88 Coors Light truck while in the main pit. Brett now held down fifth place. As Andy McMillan passed race mile 12, there was a shakeup in the lead pack. Bryce Menzies had two wheel failures at the same time and was forced to pull over to change them both. Justin Lofton got past him first, then McMillan who moved into second. Three minutes later, Jason Voss passed the stranded Menzies truck and moved into fifth. It was not looking good for the former Mint 400 champ. He got moving again, but not before giving up six positions and moving back into seventh place. Up ahead at race mile 23, the new leader, Justin Lofton, came ripping past. He was a mere three miles ahead of number 31, Andy McMillan, who came through next. Then it was Rob McCachran who came sliding through in third, followed by Brett Serapis less than a minute later. Back up front at the Fox Proving Grounds, Lofton was now three miles ahead of the chase pack and in danger of running away with his third Mint 400 championship. Justin won the Mint overall in 2015 and 2016 as part of two very dominant seasons. If he won today, he would be the first racer in history to win the Mint 400 three times overall. Meanwhile, it was another bad luck scenario for second place Andy McMillan. He sustained a flat and was forced to pull over, his second of the race. He was immediately passed by number 11, Rob McCachran. As precious seconds ticked down, number 88, Brett Serapis, was able to get past McMillan before he was able to get going again. Back in the unlimited spec class, Brock Hedger was still out ahead of the competition in his class. But Travis Chase was now in second place physically. Travis was starting to make up some ground on Hedger. Up in the lead pack, Justin Lofton remained out front. He had clean air and a relatively clear track in front of him. All he needed to do was keep it together and avoid any flat tires or mechanical issues. The chase pack, meanwhile, was hitting some lap traffic. Rob McCachran, who was sitting in second place, caught up to Formula One champion Jensen Button, who was still on his second lap in the unlimited spec class. Rob wasn't in the mood to slow down, so he gave Jensen the universal signal to move over. Having won the Mint in several classes, Rob knew that if Justin made a mistake or sustained damage to his truck, he would be perfectly positioned to snap up the victory. A few seconds later, Brett Serapis nudged Button as well. Brett was just off Rob's bumper in third place and was looking for any room to make a pass. For the relatively young upstart, a victory at the Mint this year would signal his permanent arrival in the Unlimited class. Things were not going well, though, for Andy McMillan, who sustained another flat tire at race mile 85 and was forced to pull over again. Within a few minutes, Kevin Thompson flew past him in the number 70 concrete motorsports truck. Thompson now sat in fourth place after getting past Voss, which was incredible considering his earlier run-in with Robbie Gordon. Andy pulled back on the road, but it was directly in the path of Jason Voss. Jason gave Andy a nice little tap with his bumper before making the pass. Voss had now moved back into fifth. Voss and McMillan both got back up to race speed. Andy was now sitting in sixth place with less than 30 miles to the finish. 
Bryce Menzies had made up a lot of time from his earlier mechanical troubles and was back up in seventh place on the road. Back up front, Justin Lofton was now screaming towards the finish line. He could see the lights of the Prim Valley start finish line and he was clear of the roughest part of the course. Would Rob McCachran catch him? No. Rob had sustained a flat while pushing hard to catch up to Lofton and was forced to pull over. Brett Serapis had now moved into second on the road. Lofton turned the last corner of the infield and came screaming through the finish gate. Approximately four minutes later, Brett Serapis came charging through next. Kevin Thompson came through third physically five minutes later, followed closely by Jason Voss, Andy McMillan, and Rob McCachran. The officials reviewed each of the racers' times, and the crowd went wild as they announced that Justin Lofton was the new 2019 BF Goodrich Tires Mint 400 overall champion. 31-year-old Justin Lofton from Brawley, California became the first racer in history to win the Mint 400 overall three times in his career. I guess you can just call me Mr. Mint. This is, uh, this is awesome. Uh, you know, it, it starts from the ground up. I've got great partners, uh, Fox, BFG, Method, uh, Steal It, Multicam, and, and the list goes on and on. I got the best navigator who's also my crew chief, preps this truck, puts his heart and soul into it, and I got a great crew and great people behind me, and that's, that's what makes it all, uh, all come together like this. You know, we didn't know it going into it with all the rain they were getting going across the lake bed, but here we are, we, we got the win. Justin and his team celebrated as they were presented with a $10,000 check from Fox Shocks and a $25,000 check from BF Goodrich Tires. It was an incredible performance from the young man who started in the third row and beat out an incredibly talented and diverse field of competition. Brett Serapis would take second place, a mere two and a half minutes behind first. And Jason Voss took third by a margin of five minutes. The team of Cody and Brian Parkhouse finished a mere minute and 40 seconds ahead of James Dean. It was the second Mint 400 victory for the Parkhouse team and a dominating performance all day. In the unlimited spec class, Brock Hedger came across the finish line first. He beat out Travis Chase, who took second place, and Taylor Mills, who took third. Here's a look at all of the winners from this year's BF Goodrich Tires Mint 400 Unlimited race. While the Unlimited class winners and their teams celebrated, there were many racers still on the course, battling just to finish their races. It would be hours before some of these drivers would see the finish line, but they refused to quit. Of the 550 race teams that left the start line, just over half of them would see the finish line. The Great American Off-Road Race will return to Las Vegas March 4th through the 8th in 2020. Visit themint400.com or facebook.com forward slash themint400 for complete details.